opening words this morning. On this morning we come as expressions of the love of the universe for each single thing. As these bodies of love, let us open ourselves to our mother and maker and be ourselves a song. Our first reading, God, teach me to be patient, teach me to go slow, teach me how to wait on you when my way I do not know, teach me sweet forbearance when things do not go right, so I remain unruffled when others grow up tight, teach me how to quiet my racing, rising heart, so I might hear the answer you're trying to impart. Teach me to let go, dear God, and pray undisturbed until my heart is filled with inner peace and I learn to know your will. And our second reading. It takes a little time to create a gap between the witness and the mind. Once the gap is there, you're in for a big surprise. That you are not the mind, that you are the witness, a watcher. And this process of watching is the very alchemy of real religion. Because as you become more and more deeply rooted in witnessing, thoughts start disappearing. You are, but the mind is utterly empty. That's the moment of enlightenment. That's the moment that you become, for the first time, an unconditioned, sane, really free human being. In ancient times, a king placed, had a boulder and placed it on the roadway. Then he hid himself and watched to see if anyone would remove the huge rock. Some of the king's wealthiest merchants and courtiers came by and simply walked around it. Many loudly blamed the king for not keeping the roads clear, but none did anything to getting the big stone out of the, road, out of the way. Then a peasant came along carrying a load of vegetables. On approaching the boulder, the peasant laid down his burden and tried to move the stone to the side of the road. After much pushing and straining, he finally succeeded. As the peasant picked up his load of vegetables, he noticed a purse lying in the, in the road where the boulder had been. The purse contained many gold coins and a note from the king indicating that the gold was for the person who removed the boulder from the roadway. The peasant learned that what many others never understood. <laughs> For our meditation this morning, let us calm our breath, let it lengthen, emptying ourselves as a way to prepare to be filled. Whatever last week delivered, whatever next week will hold, let us focus on our breath. Let us focus now. Let us come back home to ourselves and all that's already been true.
Our sermon comes this morning from our Faith Rocket series, and it's entitled Repainting Our Lives by Susan Lamar. Old paint on canvas as it ages sometimes becomes transparent. When that happens, it is possible in some pictures to see the original lines. A tree will show through a woman's dress. A child makes way for a dog. A large boat is no longer on an open sea. That is called pentimento, because the painter repainted, changed his mind. Perhaps it would be as well to say that the old conception, replaced by the later choice, is a way of seeing and then seeing again. Lillian Hellman from Pentimento, the Book of Portraits, 1973. Like the canvas in this passage, our life canvases carry all of our pictures, all of our story. Sometimes our earlier pictures show through, obvious to us and to the people around us. Our parents remember us as children. As our own children grow, we remember them in all their stages. Spouses remember each other as they were when they first met, when they first fell in love. Sometimes the early pictures are not transparent to others but they are there in our own inner landscapes, choices, fond memories and regrets mingle to form the final canvas. The child inside the elder is still there somewhere. There are so many images sketched on all of our hearts, layer upon layer of them. One that always stands out for me is of an elderly gentleman I met many years ago during a hospital chaplaincy. He was in for some tests, but was not particularly sick, bored mostly. We had not had an opportunity to talk at any length until this one particular afternoon when he asked me to sit down. I sat in the chair beside his bed, and he sat in the hospital gown on the side of the bed, legs dangling. Do you like being a chaplain, he asked. Yes, I replied. That's good, he said. It's good to be happy in your work. There was a pause. Tell me about your work, I ventured. There was a long pause, and then he started to stare directly into my eyes, his anguish palpable. I was a merchant of death, he said. Tell me, I said quietly. I was an engineer. I designed guided missile systems. I was good, too, but another pause and a deep breath. I made a good living, he continued nice house, put my kids through college. They're all teachers and social workers, you know. Very important work. I did very well, but another long pause. <sighs> another deep breath. I remember toward the end, just before I retired, 
We had designed a new system, system and were running a simulated test. Sure enough, the system worked just as we planned. The bomb landed within feet of its target, and my whole team cheered. They cheered, and I lost it. I screamed at them, stop it, just stop it, we just killed people. You don't cheer when you kill people. He swung his legs back on the bed and lay back, lost in his thoughts. A few moments later, his granddaughter walked into the room, a young adult recently graduated from Harvard with a degree in social work, and the gentleman transformed right before my eyes. The cloud disappeared, and his face was radiant with joy and pride and with love as he introduced us. I excuse myself, but the image has stayed with me all these years. The simultaneous anguish, anguish and pride painted on the gentleman's countenance, his canvas. A personal canvas that held those two pictures. A job that provided a good living, that launched his children, and through them his grandchildren into work that will better humanity and a career that also provided him distress and sorrow as he looks back on his life, the cloud and the glory, simultaneously, pentimento, remembrance. Repentance is, after all, a theological word for the deliberate choice to change, to paint a new picture on the canvas of our lives. Isn't that the way most of our lives work, layer upon layer, as we walk forward through making our choices and changing our minds, repainting, repenting, a continual process. We don't know how long the canvas mural of our lives will be, or how many times we will be able to see again. We never know how many times we will be given the opportunity to make different choices. All we know is that we do have will. We can make new and different choices as we journey along, we can repent. Repent, what a charged word. We don't hear it much in the secular world and rarely in Unitarian Universalism. At least I didn't, growing up in a very secular, humanist, non-theistic church and family. In fact, I grew up thinking it was a joke. It always seemed to me to be a word worthy of only mockery and ridicule, perhaps because I only ever saw it in cartoons where ratty-looking bearded men in robes carried signs saying, Repent, ye sinners. We, after all, we're you use. Sometimes it seemed that there was an underlying assumption that we would never have anything to repent from. Since we didn't believe in sin, then hey, we're all set. But since then, I've come to think of it just, it might be a useful word, the way repent is used in our culture. Its meaning has three different aspects. First, it has to do with feeling remorse. And I mean to really deeply feel and regret, humiliation or shame for something you have done. Yes, all of those are very charged words. There is an element of despair in those difficult feelings. How, we might ask, can I ever fix this? Make right the wrong that I have done or caused. How can I change what's already been done? When we have these feelings, they touch our soul and they sting. Even years later, when we remember the situation, those feelings come flooding back. They have left their mark on our canvas. Then there is the second part of repentance, the cognitive decision never to do again the action that caused the anguish. There is movement from feeling to reason. And the third part is action. To actually never again do the action that caused the anguish. In other words, to change, to transform. This includes, of course, recognizing a whole universe or set of actions that count under the umbrella of those which, from which to refrain. If cheating on a history test was cause for repentance, then the vow should cover cheating on other subjects or on income tax and so on. All the parts, feelings right down to your toes, the decision to change and the actual changes are equally important. The transformation that we're striving for is inside the deepest reaches of our being. 
a change in our soul, a link between feelings, will, and action. It is life work that is never done, and in my opinion, not done in public. Soul work is done in private, although its effects are seen in public. I think some folks get this exactly backwards. Public fi figures say, I have repented, as though their transgression is never to be seen again on the canvas of their lives. Yet in a way, this form of repentance is like being in recovery from an addiction. You are never fully recovered. Repentance is never completely over and done. Our mistakes, our bad choices, our errors in judgment, even criminal activities are always with us. We can feel the remorse and we can move on to make new and different choices, but the results can only be judged over a long time, and never solely by us. We have to do the work, but whether we have really changed will show in our lives, and that is about others. It is about our relationships. Maybe that is why repentance is such a difficult notion. We don't want control to be taken away from us. We want us to be able to say, it's over and done. It's water under the bridge. I've changed. Especially if we have. Because we do change all the time. But our actions forever live with us. Actions that went before and those from our changed selves as we go forward. What I like about the Pentimento image is that although the word shares a root with repentance, it directs our attention to a different place. It can spring us out of the darkness and difficult connotations that I've been talking about. It helps us shift into the realm of opportunity to do things differently. It assures us that there is always an opportunity to paint a different picture. That there is always an opportunity to wake up, be transformed so that others will notice the difference, even though the old image is still with us. Our awakenings happen over the course of our lifetimes. As years go by, we change, sometimes just by virtue of having mo more experience, wider and deeper observations of the effects of our actions, a closer relationship to our deepest, most ultimate values. That gentleman sitting on the edge of the hospital bed, so anguished about his career, also held a beautiful painting of his life through the values he passed on to his children and grandchildren. Perhaps even telling his story to me helped him come to terms with his life, his pentimento life. We all have pentimento lives. May we paint with care.
Our benediction today. Go with your mind clear, your eyes open, your hearts curious, to encounter other searching hearts. Go in peace. Thank you for joining us today. Peace and love to all the First Unitarian Church in Alton family. Thanks. Thank you.